Amen, amen. All right, today we're picking back up with our series on holy sexuality. We started this in early November. So I'm going to go through a quick recap of week one and two. In week one, we identified the main problem that society is having in regards to sexuality as a sexuality and gender as an identity problem. The main question we sought to answer was, who am I? Who am I? The predominant point was that what we do does not define who we are. What we do does not define who we are. The second point was that the Bible never used sexuality as someone's identity. In the second message, I talked about the image of God, and I talked about four things that are important to remember about being made in the image of God. Number one, the image of God is very good. While all of creation was good, when God made man and woman, he said it was very good. Nothing gives us more value than being made in his image. Number two, the image of God is unique. Human beings are the only created thing that bear God's image. The foundation for human rights is being made in the image of God. Number three, the image of God is male and female. Being male or female is intrinsic to being human and being made in God's image. And number four, the image of God is Christological. Jesus is God's perfect image, and everything he has accomplished for us is for the purpose of restoring to perfection the image of God in us. So that's the recap. This week we're going to look at the doctrine of sin. This is where we need to bring God's love into the discussion. Lots of people presume to have a grasp of what God's love is or isn't. And I have to tell you that we don't have any chance of understanding the love of God until we understand the depths of our own sinfulness. Apart from God, we are totally depraved. And when we fail to understand that we're totally depraved, we cheapen God's love. And we cheapen His grace. And we cheapen His mercy towards us. While we were still enemies of God, it says in Romans chapter 5, he died for us. And part of the problem is the people in the world do not understand their own depravity. Apart from God, I'm a sinner. The only reason that I stand before you now is because of his grace. That's it. One of the essential components to healthy Christianity is an understanding of the doctrine of sin. Sin is an essential component, unfortunately, of the story of creation and the fall and redemption and the eventual consummation of all things. We believe that all humanity descended from Adam and Eve, and we believe that Adam and Eve are the ones responsible for introducing sin to the whole world. Because we believe that all humans are guilty of sin, and they are born in the condition of original sin. And they're all in need of salvation. Amen? And we have to know and understand that so we don't reject the work of the cross. Those two things are linked. Original sin and the work of the cross. If Adam didn't sin and Adam didn't pass on sin to us, then there would be no need for the cross. And there would be no need for salvation. But Adam did sin. So to help us better understand humanity and in the context we're talking about, human sexuality, let's go back to the Garden of Eden to a time when God created Adam and Eve and they were obeying him perfectly. 
There's a Scottish theologian from the 18th century named Thomas Boston who called this period of time the state of innocence. Adam and Eve existed in a state of innocence. We know that they were forbidden from eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. And we know that in Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, that they disobeyed God and they fell into sin when they took of the tree and they ate of its fruit. Some people accuse God of setting Adam and Eve up for failure by having that tree in the garden in the first place. But that's not true. The book of James says that God tempts no one. James chapter 1, verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. God does not and never has tempted anyone. The tree of knowledge of good and evil was in the garden for the good of Adam and Eve and to represent that they always had a choice. They were designed and commissioned to rule and to reign and to have dominion over everything in creation, including that tree including themselves. But instead, they let the tree and their own desire for its fruit to rule over them instead. It's no different than for any of us today. We are empowered. We have the ability to rule and reign and have dominion over everything that is within our sphere. Do we not? What happens when we don't? It has dominion over us. Adam and Eve were free to choose obedience and they were free to choose disobedience. Unfortunately for all of us, they chose disobedience. And after eating, they hid themselves when they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They were afraid and they were ashamed. When they were confronted by God, they tried to shift the blame and point the fingers at others, didn't they? All of those things, all of their actions that they took, all of the things they said point to the fact that they lost their innocence. That's what man does when he's confronted. He points the fingers at others and doesn't point the finger at himself, even when it's his own fault. And interestingly enough, when Jesus came, who was innocent, who legitimately had the right to point his finger at everyone else, did not. He said, let all the, point, all the fingers point at me. Let all the fingers for all time, including Adam and Eve's, point at me. And I'll take the blame. So Jesus' sacrifice was the opposite of Adam's self-justification. Now, the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin was death. God told Adam this ahead of time. God said, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. When you look at that phrase in the Hebrew for surely die, it literally means dying, you shall die. So the consequences, the ramifications of their decision was abundantly clear. They knew exactly what would happen before they ever took part in that act. Their death ended up being both physical and it was spiritual and it involved their removal from the Garden of Eden and it involved pain and turmoil and it involved separation from God. And even in the midst of judgment, God promised an answer in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And God said that the offspring of Jesus Christ would become victorious over Satan and sin and death. That's good news, isn't it? It's the season of good news. But there was more than just the consequences of death. There's consequences that have evolved over time. Some of those things even include genetic disorders. 
This is what the National Human Genome Research Institute says about genetic disorders. A genetic disorder is a disease caused in whole or in part by a change in the DNA sequence away from the what sequence? Normal sequence. Genetic disorders can be caused by a mutation in one gene, a monogenic disorder, by mutations in multiple genes, a multifactorial inheritance disorder, by a combination of gene mutations and environmental factors, or by damage to chromosomes, changes in the number or structure of entire chromosomes, the structures that carry genes. As we unlock the secrets of the human genome, the complete set of human genes. We are learning that nearly all diseases have a genetic component. Some diseases are caused by mutations that are inherited from the parents and are present in an individual at birth, like sickle cell disease. Other diseases are caused by acquired mutations in a gene or a group of genes that occur during a person's life. Such mutations are not inherited from a parent, but occur either randomly or due to some environmental exposure, such as cigarette smoke. These include many cancers as well as some forms of neurofibromatosis. That's a genetic disorder of the nervous system. So these abnormalities happen and have happened over time as a result of the fall of man. And this issue of genetic disorders affects every arena of what it means to be human. And even within the context of human sexuality. And unfortunately, these conditions are very real and they're very tragic, but they are the nat natural consequences of sin and the fall. They are natural abnormalities. They are not proof of confusion or mistakes in the gender of a person. And in and of themselves, they are not sinful, even though sin is the causing agent that has brought the change in genetics over the course of time. And these conditions do not define who people are. A person with a disability is not defined by that disability. In each one of these situations, the image of God has been distorted, just like it's been distorted in all of us. It's no different than for the rest of us who are free from genetic abnormalities but still have the distortion of sin. Another thing that the fall created was guilt. Many people believe and view guilt as a feeling they get when they do something wrong. Biblically speaking, that's not guilt. Guilt is a judicial concept about where we stand in regards to God. It's not a feeling. Many people in the world commit sin every day. They have no guilt about it but they are guilty. Amen? It's about whether we have violated the holiness of God and whether we are liable for punishment because of that. And everyone who has ever lived is guilty. And this is where the doctrine of sin becomes so offensive to the world because the world sees it as unfair that we're held accountable for Adam's Screw up. Many people believe they are good people. As I've witnessed to folks, I've had them tell me, Pastor, you don't understand, I'm a good person. So to believe that they are guilty of something, when they believe they've done nothing wrong, that becomes offensive. But the mistake that the world makes is in thinking that they have a right to declare what's fair or unfair or what is right or not right. They take too much to themselves. When we think something is unfair, it's usually because we're looking at it from our perspective instead of his perspective. So we have to look at Jesus to understand what guilt means. A few verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
Verse 22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Adam was a real historical person, a man who is our representative in death. And Jesus was a real historical person, a man who is our representative in life. Romans chapter 5, verse 17, For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Amen? By Adam's disobedience we became condemned, we became guilty, and by Jesus' obedience we are declared not guilty and made righteous. So we have to hold those two things in tension. When we think it's not fair... Well, if we weren't assigned Adam's guilt, we have no right to Jesus' righteousness. Can't have one without the other. If we want to complain it's unfair that we're all guilty because of Adam's sin, it's no more unfair than the fact we're made righteous because Jesus died on the cross in our place. It's no more unfair than Jesus being innocent and having to die for us. Another moral and ethical consequence of the entrance of sin into the world and the fall is our understanding of human sexuality. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 3 that everybody is under sin, both Jews and Greeks. David told us in Psalm 51 that everyone is conceived in sin. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3 says, Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. All of these verses speak to the concept of original sin. Now, original sin is like the Trinity. You're not going to find the phrase original sin in the Bible. But you will see it preached consistently from the beginning to the end. Original sin is not the same thing as the first actual sin of Adam. Original sin is the result of that first sin of Adam. And it's had significant ramifications on every aspect of mankind. This is the one great equalizer about all of humanity. It doesn't matter if you're white or black or Hispanic or Asian, or whether you're young or old, or whether you're male or female, or whether you have privilege or don't have privilege, or whether you live in this part of the world or that part of the world, everybody starts life in original sin. A lot of the things we do with our lives, our thoughts, our actions, our desires, the things that we say, the things we think, a lot of those things come out of that original sin we carry in with us. And until we understand the depravity of that which is in us, we can't fully grasp the love of God and our need to be redeemed and renewed and saved in Jesus Christ. Amen? You okay? Is this all right? So we're born with a polluted nature. That nature is corrupt. And because that nature is corrupt, it goes on to produce more and more sin the longer we live. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says, None is righteous, no, not one. So the corruption is pervasive. It permeates every single thing, including sexual desire. And as I said a few weeks ago, Original sin is not an actual substance of us. In other words, original sin is not who we are. It's how we are. It's merely a pollution and a corruption and a perversion of our full humanity. It's the distortion of the image of God in us. 
Sin has put us on the default mode, the default path of rebellion. That's what it's done. It puts us on the default path of rebellion versus the default mode of obedience. But again, it's not who we are, it's how we are. This doesn't mean that unsaved people can't do good things because they can. There's unsaved people doing great things all over the world all the time. But it does mean that they have the same problem that the rest of us have. We need a solution for that original sin problem. We need the redeeming power of Jesus Christ. And without it, nobody has any hope for eternal life. That's the truth. So this study is about human sexuality. And I've spent three weeks now talking about identity, the image of God, and now the doctrine of sin. Why? Let's look at this picture. What is that? Everybody knows the Leaning Tower of Pisa. When they were building this tower in the 12th century, by the time they got to the second floor, it started to lean to the right. Why did it start to lean to the right? Because the foundation was bad. If we're going to talk about human sexuality from the biblical perspective... We have to have our foundation set right. That foundation involves our identity, the image of God, and the doctrine of sin. That's why I've spent the time speaking on it. We can't start anywhere else. And who we are, the image of God, and the doctrine of sin applies equally to every one. There was no one exempt from those three things. No one. I bring that up because I want to talk about three errors that have crept into the church that we have to correct if we want to make inroads in this arena with the society around us that is struggling with who they are, why they were made, what they're worth, what their purpose is, all of those things. The first one is the error of prideful condemnation. We are all sinner and saint made in the image of God. We all have a sin problem. For those of us that name Jesus as our Savior, we've taken hold of the remedy, right? But there is still a sin problem that we spend the rest of our days wrestling through. Do we not? Have any of you seasoned saints attained? Barbara, are you there yet? You're not? Dang it! You mean when I'm your age, I'm still going to have to deal with sin? She says, maybe. She's close. She's close, praise God. But she's got 40 years on me. Not looking forward to that. So when we forget the foundation from which we all come into this life, we fall into error forgetting one of my favorite phrases, there except for the grace of God go I. And unbelievers have a negative view of the Christian community in general because we've treated sin issues differently based on our preferences. We have treated sexual sin and same-sex attraction as though it's some higher-level category of sin that, that can't be, you know, we can't get near that. It might jump on us. But we're okay with outbursts of wrath all the time. What's the biblical truth about sin? Is there one sin worse than the others? 
There's one from my reading that can't be forgiven. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Aside from that, I don't see any qualifiers on sin. Jesus' blood covers a multitude of sins, the Scripture says. But the church's most hateful speech has been resolved for sins in this category, sexuality. As if there's some special place in hell for those kind of sinners. It might be the idolaters that want to watch out. Just saying. And it bothers me when you talk with Christians about this and their first thing that comes out of their mouth is that about how people have got to watch out for that hell fire. I think it was Paul who said it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Not the signs that say you're going to burn in hell. I don't recall Jesus using that one. Hello? The point I'm trying to make is if we really want to advance the conversation about holy sexuality with the culture in which we find ourselves, we have to adopt the attitude of the Apostle Paul when he said Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. The most wicked sinner is still a person made in the image of God. There's still a person that the Lord will accept if they repent. You want to know one story that burns me up? The story of Manasseh. The most wicked king in Israel's history. Practiced idolatry. Encouraged sin in the nation of Israel. Burned his own children to Molech. Practiced spiritism went to mediums, practiced witchcraft. For decades, 40-some years, he did that stuff. And what happened to him? At the end of his life, he repented, and the Lord restored him. It's, un it's unreal to me, but that's what the Lord does when you turn that fast that fast when we want to talk to sinners and unbelievers about sexuality and the issues surrounding it we need to do so from a posture that we are just as deserving of hellfire as they are we can't talk to them based on our pet sins the ones that we have absolutely no problem ignoring But when it comes to certain ones, we got this line, oh, no, can't, we can't go there. We got to stop that. Error number two, the problem of diagnosis. One of the problems with dealing with sexual issues by the church is that we want to diagnose everything. Now, it makes sense. We're in a culture of diagnosis, aren't we? When we're sick, what do we do? We go to the doctor, we tell them our symptoms, in the hopes that the doctor can diagnose what's wrong with us. You know, if my symptom is chronic fatigue, though, that means I'm like got 75 potential diagnoses that I could have. But they look at us, they write down our symptoms, and then they guess what's wrong with us. That's why they call it medical practice. Right? How much more for sexual issues? For example, for decades, homosexuality has been placed, the blame for that has been placed on mothers, fathers, trauma. And it's become normal for the church to try and categorize or diagnose these issues, whether it's true or not. And I'm not dismissing those as possible choices. But often environment correlates to the issues. But that doesn't mean it caused the issues. Correlation does not equal causation. I can help you. The problem of sexual sin does not need to be diagnosed. It has a diagnosis. It's called a sin problem. Done. 
You know what's nice about that? There's a remedy. It's called Jesus Christ. It don't take a whole lot of diagnosis. It's a sin problem. There's a sin answer. In the human sexuality arena, parents have been blamed more than any other source for children who have issues with sexuality. Did you know the scripture does not blame parents for sexual sins of kids? The reason people struggle with sin is because they're sinners. You can raise a child in a loving environment with wonderful parents and all kinds of positive affirmation, and the child can still grow up to be bound in sin. Here's the truth. Original sin is the cause behind all sin. If you're a parent living with guilt and shame over your child's behavior, no matter what age that child is, and you're asking yourself, what did I do wrong? What could I have done differently? Be set free today in Jesus' name. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Do I need to prove it to you today? We do our best to influence our kids for better or for worse, but perfect parenting does not guarantee a good result. I'll prove it to you from Scripture. Adam and Eve had the perfect father in the perfect environment without a sin nature, and they chose wrong. Who would dare convince you you could do better than God? It's a lie from hell and from the accuser. God is perfect. His kids were in a perfect state, and they made a choice. Let yourself off the hook, parents. Tell the devil he's a liar. You cannot produce godly children. Only God produces the godly. It is God that gives life. It is God that brings things back to life. It is God that redeems. The only thing you can do is try and be a godly example. That's it. That's about as much control as you have over the issue, what you can do in yourself. This is why the doctrine of sin is one of the foundations we must all remember not only in the issue of sexuality, but in every issue. These sinful issues have one cause, original sin. The environment, what you said or didn't say, what you did or didn't do, what you gave them or didn't give them, that is all secondary stuff. At the end of the day, every person has a choice. That's why some kids live in absolute hell. And when they grow up, they walk in the light. And that's why some grow up in absolute light. And when they grow up, they walk in bondage. It's not your fault. And this is not a difference of opinion. I'm not trying to make you feel good. This is biblical truth. If your environment could produce your holiness, Jesus Christ would not have needed to come. If you believe that your impact was that bad on your kids, what you're saying is that your justification and sanctification can be achieved by human effort. That's not Scripture. That's not Scripture. Our justification and our sanctification depends on Jesus Christ and Christ alone. It's not an insignificant matter. It's foundational. It's foundational. We cannot blame the origins of sexual sin or any other sin or any other area 
other than where that blame belongs, and that is original sin. People don't have sexual attraction problems. They have a sin problem. They don't have a sexual orientation problem. They have a sin problem. And because the church for so long has viewed homosexuality as abnormal, they think it needs some special diagnosis or some special treatment or some special analyst. It doesn't. It's sin. They need Jesus. Period. Period. Y'all okay? I know I'm getting... I know. God, the Spirit of God burning in me. Sin in general feels normal to people. Homosexuals feel normal. They don't feel weird. Only you think they're weird. And until the light of the gospel shines in there and gives them that conviction, then they go, oh my gosh, that feels weird. They didn't know it up until that moment. Just like we didn't know it up until the Lord shines some light on us. And we go, oh my gosh, I've been doing that. That's wrong. Forgive me, God. Same process for everybody. The only cure is Jesus Christ. Error number three, the problem of category. Because we forget that sin in general is an original sin problem, we try and take steps to make things more tolerable and acceptable. This is a tactic of the world. It should not be a tactic of the church. There are two ways the world has tried to sanitize sexual sin, and it's creeping into the church day by day. The first is coming up with the term sexual orientation. And the church is bought off on this hook, line, and sinker. Sexual orientation, the whole idea behind it, that our feelings, our attractions are, are normal and natural and not of our own choosing and something we get at birth, that it's an unchosen, indwelling condition, that we have no control over our desires, we're just a slave to whatever we feel or think. That's nonsense. This category has been created because it's, it makes it easier for people to be accepting and tolerant of sin. It's a lie. You won't find anywhere in Scripture where people are assigned a sexual orientation. Doesn't exist. There are people with same-sex attractions, yes. There are people in the church with same-sex attractions, yes. What the church has done, by and in large part, is to give people with same-sex attractions, a couple of options. Well, be ex-gay or be celibate. I have a problem with that. Why do I have a problem with that? Because we're elevating sexual orientation to a level that it's something that can be sanctified. That it's something that can be redeemed. The whole thought process is wrong. Some of you look nervous. Let me help you. Sexual orientation is a humanistic, secular idea. It's a worldly framework. And here the church is trying to dress that framework with biblical principles. No, the framework is wrong. The framework is sin. It has a solution. We don't invent a different framework so we can make it more tolerable for people. Because a person has the capacity to have same-sex attractions or temptations, that does not mean that it's sin. We are all tempted with desires in all kinds of ways, are we not? All the time. That does not equal having sin. What's interesting to me is the concept of original sin fits all the descriptors of the concept of sexual orientation. Original sin is not a chosen condition. It belongs to everybody. Original sin is an indwelling pattern of sinful desire and sinful behavior. Original sin feels normal when we're in our natural minds and they haven't been renewed. And I said earlier, 
people who are saved, including me, we engage in sinful behavior until the Holy Spirit shines a light on that sinful behavior and points it out. And then we go, oh, man, that was dumb. Sometimes. Sometimes we want to wrestle with it a little bit. But hopefully we go, oh, man, that was dumb. Lord, forgive me. Release me. So my point is, I don't need the framework of sexual orientation to try and figure out what's happening. I have a framework. It's called sin. And I have a solution. It's called Jesus. It's not a category problem. It's a sin problem. Now, some people try and claim the same sex and romantic attractions are rooted in the image of God, that they're just part of being human, that they don't come from the fall, and that they're not from original sin. Well... If same-sex behavior is sinful, which it is, according to the Scripture, that means it's rooted in the fall and in original sin, not in the image of God. So then the next question is, if it's from the fall, is it a natural consequence or is it a moral consequence? Diseases and physical disabilities are natural consequences. They're not immoral. If same-sex attractions were natural, they could at best be neutral and they could potentially be sanctifiable, but they're not. Acting on same-sex desire, according to the Scripture, is sinful in every case. There is nothing neutral about it. Sexual sin always involves a moral component, so same-sex attraction finds its origins in original sin. There's nothing natural or innocent about original sin. Amen. So sexual orientation, categorically incorrect, does not fit biblical framework regarding sexual morality. When it comes to same-sex attraction and desire, the problem is sin and Jesus is the answer. The last error and the second way the world has tried to sanitize this issue is this. I was born that way. That's what the popular culture is saying. Now, if you're shrewd enough, you can see that this is just an alternate alternate attempt by the enemy to sanitize sin. Culture talks about it as though it's indisputable, scientifically proven, and fact. Now, let me help you. There have been numerous, numerous scientific studies that have tried to prove where the biological or environmental factors are that influence someone to walking or having same-sex attractions. None of them have been conclusive in their findings. This is what the American Psychiatric Association says. Some people believe that sexual orientation is innate and fixed. However, sexual orientation develops across a person's lifetime. Now, I just said I don't have room for the sexual orientation framework. But I'm not the one saying this. These are carnal human people who do have that framework and even they say, doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. They study this. They have not been able to determine what causes people to believe that they are attracted to people of the same sex. So it is reckless and it is irresponsible for the world, for our Hollywood movie stars, for the culture to tell us, well, these people are just born that way. No, they're not. It's not proven reality. But this is the adversary's tactic. See, if you're born this way, though, then it's no more wrong than your hair color or your eye color. It's just bull. Now, it works for those in the world, but it should not work for those of us in the church. Being born sinful is not an excuse for sin, is it, church? Right. Oh, I was born a thief. That's why I steal. Oh, I was born an addict. That's why I use dope. 
or alcohol. Well, I got new good news for you. Let's say that 15, 20 years down the line, they prove that it is because you were born that way. Let's say that that becomes established scientific fact in the, in the years ahead. I have good news for you. Jesus said, ye must be born again. So great, you were born a thief, good, be born again. You were born alcoholic, great, be born again. You were born homosexual, great, be born again. That's the answer from the gospel. You were born a failure, great, be born again. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things, A-L-L, have become new. So I don't care if you feel you were born that way. Be born again. When you get born again, it's easy to deal with that stuff. When you're born again, you receive the capacity to hate your own sin without hating yourself. You receive the capacity to see clearly what your sexuality is and that it's not who you are, it's how you are. You can put to death your sinful desires when you're born again. You can put off yourself and put on Christ Jesus when you're born again. Whatever your condition is, ye must be born again. That's the epitome of good news. Jesus Christ made the way. Amen? Let's review quickly. In order to understand God's love for us, we must understand our total depravity. The doctrine of sin is essential to this understanding. The consequences of original sin were death and guilt, and that brought both natural and moral consequences. None of these things make us who we are, but rather they show us how we are and our desperate need for the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. We cannot afford to ignore the circumstances of who we are. When we do, we forget that there, except for the grace of God, go we. We focus incorrectly on the diagnosis versus realizing that all of these issues are sin problems with a God-sized solution. And we categorize these issues incorrectly by accepting secular framework instead of biblical framework. Lastly, we must reject the idea that people are born that way. And regardless of how we're born or not born, we have to be born again through the blood of Jesus Christ and his atoning death and his glorious resurrection. Amen? Amen. Next week, we will begin to discuss what is God's pattern for holy sexuality for everybody on the planet? Father, thank you in Jesus' name. God, I thank you for those you're setting free right now. Parents who have been guilty, feeling guilty, people that have struggled. I thank you, come Holy Spirit, and just continue the work that you begun during this message. In the name of Jesus, I bless every person here. I thank you, Lord, for those that are not with us, that are ill, be healed in Jesus' name. We come against everything that the enemy has brought out against you. We cancel all assignments of the enemy against the people in our body and those that we know receive healing in Jesus' name. We declare it right now. We thank you, God, for it. In the name of Jesus, amen.